kind of visual audio First thing on the agenda is public hearing. Um, 
Board of Aldermen. Uh, the first thing is the agenda. Are there any changes? Seeing none, a uh, second thing is public hearing proposed ballot question for December 10, 1985 special meeting. Six million dollar bond for waterfront. Is there any uh, public comment?
for housing. And within this area, there were early phases, we constructed 150 units of housing. This plan here depicts the, the profile of, of the development, and as you can see, it's been designed to assure the preservation of views to the lake. Uh, the largest building would be the, uh, the Lakeside Hotel, which would be five to six stories high, approximately 72 feet at its highest point, and even that building would be below the escarpment. The vast majority of the buildings would be of uh, three-story construction. Just very briefly, the project will be financed with, with tax increment financing. The current uh, tax increment financing district, as revised by the Board of Aldermen, is 25 acres, which is either owned or controlled by the Alden Waterfront Corporation. Currently, within that 25 acres, there's $88,000 per year of taxes which are being generated. Now, under this plan, that becomes the frozen tax base. And I say that, the $7 million of assessed lot value becomes the frozen tax base. As taxes increase, if they do as a result of increase in the tax rate ceiling, that base will also increase upwards. But the tax increment is that development which will occur as a result of the public improvements on that property. Now it's projected that that, develop, uh, that that development will generate over a 10 year period an additional $1.4 million in taxes or a total of $62 million in, in uh, private development. A portion <coughs> of this tax increment will be consumed by the debt. Uh, it's, it varies in the first couple of years, but uh, it levels out to be about $700,000 a year in the, in the later years of the project. That will be the principal and interest on the $6 million bond. That will totally be paid for by taxes generated by the Alden Waterfront Project. So it's assured and it's guaranteed that there will be no risk to the taxpayer. The taxpayer will not be paying for these improvements. These improvements will be paid for by taxes generated by the project itself. As early as 1990, it's generated that there will be about a $300,000 surplus in other words, after the principal and interest on the bond is, is paid off, there'd be $300,000 which would be available for distribution to the city and to the school district and would uh, provide desperately needed uh, tax relief to both the city and, and the schools. As we get into the later years of the project, the 20-year projections, it's projected that there'll be $2 million or more in taxes produced. At that time, the bond will, will be paid off and all those taxes will be available to the city and the school district. So that's a brief overview as to what the December 10th election is about. Thank you. <clears throat> is there any public comment? Any questions from the board? Riprap 
that we're talking about, I think probably the closest example, if you go to the, uh, I think it's called the Champlain Mill in Winooski, on the Winooski River, there's a small, par uh, small park just on the bridge side of that uh, Champlain Mill. And the riprap stone comes from uh, the quarry of Winooski, and it's a large red stone about that size. And I agree with you in terms of the riprap that you've seen where the riprap is dumped and you get these jagged points. What we've done in Winooski uh, Park is we place the stone, we don't dump it, we place the stone with a crane. So that basically you have a flat surface and where you have the voids between the stones, you what's called chinking, you put smaller stones in there. The riprap then would have uh, a much smoother face to it than the jagged stone. Uh, the importance about the inclined plane or the riprap is that as the water raises and lowers, most of you know that the water fluctuation is about 8 to 10 feet, not in one year, but over a period of years, from high water to low water. This allows access to the water. The vertical edge where the navy is does not allow you access to the water, the vertical edge. So. Uh, in that area, we have a vertical edge. We would have a boardwalk below the vertical edge that would be at the water level. So you'd be able to walk along the promenade and go down and walk along the boardwalk on the water. Where the riprap is, again, you'd be able to negotiate down. It wouldn't be like the railroad track crossings where you dump the stone. It would be set in place similar to the park in Winooski. That's the best explanation I can give. Any other public comments? Uh, Rick Sharp, Ward 2. Um, as you know, I've, all, I've commented on uh, this uh, subject a number of times already. So I would like to go over the main points where I think are the um, most important questions with regard to this plan. I think there are basically three interrelated questions that have to be resolved. Um, first is who owns the fill land um, in the Burlington Harbor? The second is what do we want on our waterfront? And the third is, is this a good deal for the city from an economic standpoint? Um, in regard to the first issue, um, I think that we've been talking about uh, the public trust doctrine now for approximately two and a half years, and um, we still have no resolution of that issue at this time. I've put out a memorandum already that uh, relies upon two Supreme Court opinions, one from the um, U.S. Supreme Court, the other from the Vermont State Supreme Court. Both of those holdings are that uh, the still land in Burlington Harbor must be used for public uses and cannot be put to um, private uses. Um, I would argue very strongly that um, what the city of Burlington should do is very similar to what was done in the city of Chicago, and that is that uh, the spilled land be reclaimed by the state of Vermont and held in trust for all the people by the state, um, and that uh, more of that land be preserved for public access along the lake's edge. The city of Chicago currently has a wide open waterfront as a result of the uh, 1892 decision of uh, Illinois Central versus the state of Illinois. And I think that that same um, type of uh, procedure could be done in the state of Vermont. We can preserve a lot more of this space uh, for public access. So we will not have a hotel um, building located within 25 feet of the lake's edge. I think that much more of that can, can be preserved for um, public use. Um, we had quite a bit of discussion about whether or not the public trust doctrine exists. I have um, put out a document um, saying what my authorities are. I would like to have uh, anyone who is opposed to, um, to that position and says that this still land can be used for um, hotels and condominiums to put out a legal document uh, which cites to their authorities as to why those kind of uh, facilities can in fact be located on that property. Um, I think that we've heard Peter Clavel and other people talking about this project refer to the fact that a staking was located on the Meadowlands in, uh, in New Jersey. I would agree that a staking is in fact a public use that is permitted on such fill lands. I would also say that, that a civic center um, could be located on this fill land, possibly even a retail pavilion which would be open to the public. Certainly ferry docks, railroad uses, sewers, uh, a sewer uh, treatment plant, a water facility, those are all public uses which this land can be put. But I am not aware of a single case in the United States which says that, that fill land can be devoted to private condominiums and private hotels. I think those are per perfectly private uses um, which the public trust doctrine cannot be stretched uh, to that extent to say that they can be located on that land. But I don't think that we're getting a good deal um, in this project in terms of the mix of, of uh, public 
space is going to be left open to the public. And that space which is going to be devoted to private music. The, um, had quite a bit of discussion as to how much space is going to be left open to the public. Um, from my calculation, it looks like the net that we are getting, um, based upon the Schedule J, which I presented to you at the last um, Alderman's meeting, uh, at which I spoke, um, seems to indicate that there's a net of approximately one and a half to two acres that we are in fact getting from uh, the Alden uh, Corporation. Um, I don't think that that's sufficient when you realize that uh, we have a legal claim to be 12 or 13 acres um, on this waterfront. And I don't think that that's what the, the people of the city of Burlington have said that they wanted in the past. I don't think that's what they, what they want today. That gets to the second question, what do we want on our waterfront? Um, the group which I represent, the Citizens Waterfront Group, has proposed a plan um, which would include a waterfront park from one end of the city to the other, um, which we would like to see to be wide enough to accommodate both a bicycle path, an area for people that want to sit on the lake's edge and not be disturbed by bicycles, and something that could be, uh, trees could be planted in. We could have a, a, what we would call a maple gateway park in between the city. We feel that this is in fact what uh, the people of Burlington want that that is more in keeping with our unique Vermont environment and that that's what should be located on this land and all along uh, the lake's edge. And that's why we support the bicycle path and work so hard to create that public space all along the lake's edge. I came back to Burlington, um, Vermont after finishing law school um, because I didn't want to live in a state like New Jersey or a state like um, Florida where condominiums and hotels are located within 25, 65 feet of the lake's edge, and the public is routinely excluded um, from the water's edge. I want Vermont to feel like Vermont. I want it to be a unique place. I want it to be a, a park space along the lake's edge. I want to preserve this land for that park space for my children and generations to come. And, I, and, and I've got to say that, that, uh, that I don't see anything different between this project and those projects which are being built routinely in Florida and New Jersey and other areas of the country. The third question is whether or not this is economically a good deal for the city of Burlington. Um, I think that we started out with the idea that we were going to get a UDAG grant of some $17 million, and um, what was coming to city coffers would be something in excess of $30 million um, when that UDAG grant was in fact came back over the 20 year period that uh, was projected for. At the same time, we would begin to receive tax dollars from uh, this project from um, the first date in which it, um, the new buildings were set at the full economic value. And I would point out that the Radisson Hotel right now is constructing an addition to, um, to its building uh, next April when that building is complete and the new tax assessment is made. They will begin to pay tax dollars which will come into the city coffers in order to uh, defray school expenses and other city expenses from the day that they start to move that building. What we are in fact doing here, if we okay this bond issue and if this uh, tax incremental financing goes through, is we are declaring the 24, 24 of the most valuable acres in our entire city to be a tax exempt zone for a period of approximately 20 years. I think that's exactly the opposite of what our uh, tax policy has been in the past. I think I've heard uh, many members of this board talk about how much tax exempt property there is in the city that the, the UBM doesn't pay. Um, taxes, uh, the fiscal diet and, and many other properties in the city are not on the tax rolls, yet they use public services such as police and, and, uh, and fire services, and they're not adding anything to our tax base. What you are in fact doing by approving this bond is you are creating a tax dead zone for the next 20 years. You are guaranteeing that we will not receive any income from this project other than those increments that are projected to begin possibly as early as 1990. I don't think that we will in fact see that by 1990, but it would in fact be a much later date um, were this uh, to go through. Um, my own opinion is that the development will occur on the waterfront, whether or not this bond issue goes through, and that by, um, by approving the bond issue, we're in fact guaranteeing that those funds will not come into city coffers instead of um, guaranteeing that we will in fact get additional tax revenue. One of, the, one of the major reasons for building this, as I understand it, is the tax revenues that we will get from it. But under the current plan, we will be giving up those tax revenues for up to 20 years. And I take exception to the flyer which was passed out 
um, this week. I think it's highly uh, this weekend. I think it's highly susceptible in saying that uh, that this project will not cost city taxpayers a penny. That is not in fact the case. It will cost city taxpayers 13 million dollars in tax revenues that we will give up over the next 20 years of this site. For all of those reasons, and for the technical reasons that there are in fact some serious problems with the legislation that was passed, it seems to indicate to me that that the uh, that the tax incremental district would have to return um, the the, uh, the funds to pay off that bond would have to be in a period of 10 years, not 20 years, as projected by um, the administration at this point. I also think that there's a um, problem there in terms of whether or not any of these funds can be shared with the city. Uh, with, the, uh, with the school department as well. And then the third issue that, uh, that seems to be lacking in, um, in this um, agreement or in this legislation is that whether or not uh, the city could in fact um, use any of those funds in the fifth year and later years if there were any excess funds to in fact uh, uh, go to the schools and, and go into city coffers. Um, none of those things are left in this legislation. I would um, ask that, uh, that you postpone uh, the decision on this issue until um, we've had time to go back to the legislature and get this legislation straightened out um, so we're putting the, uh, the horse before the cart instead of the other way around. There are also a couple of other technical problems in terms of um, the Schedule J, which is attached to the uh, development agreement, does not include a right of way for uh, the bicycle path. And although um, we hear in all the literature that uh, we're going to have a bicycle path from this, um, there's in fact only a 60-foot wide right-of-way um, for the street. I think that the uh, development agreement should be changed and amended to include, at a minimum, um, an inclusion of the, uh, the bicycle path uh, within a guaranteed right-of-way. The final thing that I see wrong with the development agreement is that uh, unlike uh, um, what the city administration is telling us now, that um, all that is in fact guaranteeing um, the repayment of this bond issue. I don't see anything in that development agreement that says that all that is going to guarantee that repayment. All that it does is, is say that the city and all that agree to, to uh, at a later time agree to a tax uh, um, arrangement which would allow the repayment of that bond. I don't, I don't see any guarantee in that agreement at this time. All there is an agreement to agree at a later date. For all those reasons, uh, the public should turn down um, this bond vote, and um, we should attempt to get more public space on the lake's edge and uh, lower cost to city taxpayers. Thank you very much. Don't leave yet. Yes. Um, all the people who uh, will speak. Did you have a question, Jen? Rick, I just wanted to clarify just for a second in my own mind. If I was creating a 25 acre tax explain that to you, how that's happening to this? Yeah, what I'm talking about um, is that um, although this project will in fact pay taxes, those taxes will not come into the city, city tax coffers. It will instead go to paying off that bond issue. So in effect what you're doing is the same thing as UBM and all the other tax exempt properties in the city. We do not generate any money from that, from those acres, from that acreage. That, that adds to uh, our general revenue, both in schools and in the city itself, to be able to pay for the services that are necessary in those areas, such as police, um, the uh, uh, fire department, and the school. In effect, what you're doing is you're creating a tax exempt zone yes. here in, yeah. term, in terms of- Even though they are paying taxes, we are creating a tax exempt Because we do not get the money ourselves. It's the same effect as, as, as a tax exempt property like UBM, which just pays us no tax. If there's a surplus over, as you know, if there's a surplus over the principal interest payment, uh, which there's projected to be by year five, the city would be sharing in that. Uh, those, that money would be directly going to the general fund. So how do you see that as being taxed? Well, I think that you know, you're, the projections from what Mr. Clavel has said um, are, are not entirely um, reliable. They are merely projections at this point. This is, it, Mr. Clavel has said that this is a highly speculative venture and that it is not certain what the outcome of this uh, will be at all. I would be willing to wager you right now that in tax year um, 1989, which it says in your, your flyer, we will not have $300,000 available from, uh, from this project for two reasons. One is that I think it's going to take longer to get the, the permitting process done so that it won't come in at tax year 89 if the bond does pass. 
So, so, so what, well, what I want to clarify, this is not a tax increase. <coughs> what you said earlier, that they will not be paying any taxes, that's not, that's not quite accurate. Then, right? the, the, they will what I'm saying, the effect, the effect of this is the same as exempting UBM. Even though they're paying taxes, they, they, they're not paying taxes. That's right, because the taxes are not coming into the city <coughs> tax coffers, okay? They're in fact going to pay off, um, 13, $13 million dollars will go to pay off uh, the, the uh, improvements that are put in. Thank you. Thank you. City Attorney. <coughs> What is the status of that, uh, that stipulation? Uh, the stipulation will uh, be presented to the court uh, forthwith. Uh, it is not now uh, uh, before uh, the court, but it will, uh, it's, it's contemplated that it will be before the court quite promptly. And it's been approved by uh, all three parties? It's been approved by the city, it's approved by the state,
interested in the point. I'm sorry, I don't have the document that you passed out a couple of weeks ago. You, you noticed that you, know, you distributed both the alternative enrollment plan. If my memory is correct, one of the points that you made in criticizing the city's position that we're not getting a, a terribly good deal, in your opinion, on the waterfront regarding our relation to all that, but you had a better suggestion. I, I'm paraphrasing, but I think I have it right. That your thought is that under the public trust doctrine, uh, essentially the legislature has the power to seize the Alden property without compensation and turn it over to people in the state of Vermont as a public park. As a socialist, actually, I find this an interesting concept. But I wonder, certainly for this to happen, we will need a majority of members of the Vermont State Legislature in support of the government and support of the state senate. Now, can you tell me who you have spoken to in the Vermont State Legislature, if you spoke to the Governor Cunin, and when you expect them to be seizing this land without compensation and turning it over to the public as a, as a park? I have uh, spoken with a few legislators about uh, this issue uh, very briefly. The issue is it really doesn't receive and hasn't, I don't think, received the public attention that, that it needs to receive until we get into this situation where, um, where it's necessary to resolve it. I would hope that, um, that your administration and other people that, that uh, uh, other progressives in uh, this town that would have liked to see more public access on the lake said would have taken this issue to um, the legislature, you know, possibly as early as two years ago when uh, John Franco um, first, you know, found out about the public trust doctrine. And I'm quoting from him when he says that, the, that for legal purposes, the fill land is the same as the lake bottom itself. It belongs to the people of the state of Vermont. Rick, you are, we are in three weeks going to bring a, a proposition before the people. Some of us think that it's the best proposal that we brought before the people to waterfront's development, our waterfront's development. And in fact, if we're not successful, we may be wrong, but we think that if we're not successful, what's going to come down the pike will be sufficiently worse. You are urging people to vote no, and you are proposing an alternative. I am suggesting to you, and I would like to hear you, in front of the people here, answer the question, that you have absolutely no support for your proposal, that there may not be one out of 180 members of the Vermont State Legislature, nor the governor, who will give five seconds of thought to your idea that the, leg that the legislature will be seizing without compensation. Point of order. I think this is important. Is this no, a public debate or a public forum? I think it's not inappropriate to ask Rick a question. This is a very Point important order. point. Excuse me. Um, I think it's in the nature of uh, questions back and forth. Do you have any problem with it? Yes. Maybe other people want to see it because I've got a public debate. Plus, we'll hear from everybody who wants to speak. That's usually how we conduct our business. We're, we're going to give everyone a chance to speak. Rick is saying to vote no because he has a better idea. I am suggesting that I have not heard of one member out of 180 members of the Vermont State Legislature, nor the governor, who will support this idea. And I think if we vote no because we think that Rick's idea is correct, that particular idea will never happen. So Rick, I ask you again, tell me if the governor or any member of the Vermont State Legislature is prepared to support your proposal to seize the waterfront land now valued at $400,000 an acre and convert it over to the people as a public park. Please tell me the names of the members of the legislature who will support that proposal. I have not spoken with, uh, with members of the legislature to a large extent about this, nor have I spoken to the governor about it. I think that it's something that, uh, uh, that definitely uh, could happen, and I would certainly hope that, that, uh, that the legislature uh, does in fact take that action. Legislature of the state of Illinois did that, and today the Chicago waterfront is wide open to the public. We can legislature of Illinois did that 90 years ago, under a particularly peculiar circumstance having to do with a lot of graft and relationship with their railroad. Once again, I ask you, you're asking people to vote no. You have every right in the world to do that. I don't mean to be part of you now. But what you are suggesting, to my mind, has absolutely no support from anybody in the legislature who in fact will have to act in that direction. And you had said you had wished that this administration had gone forward to my opinion to ask them to seize the property worth $400,000 an acre. I would mention to you that this administration has gone down to my pillia to ask them to pass charter changes overwhelmingly passed by the people of Burlington, and they wouldn't support that. So my immediate thought was not to ask them to seize the property presently held in private hands to make it a public park. I did not think that my efforts would meet immediate success in that direction. You have been working on this issue for several years. If you have had more success, please tell us about it. Because if the people follow your advice, 
They're going to want to see your leadership and get your idea for path. I suggest that there is not one member of the legislature, and certainly not the governor, who supports your idea, and that if we went in that direction, it would be a total disaster. Thank you. I think if we get a fair public debate on the issue, and the people know about the public trust doctrine, that uh, they may very well decide to exercise their rights in that land which belongs to them. I you wish wanted to make, you, you suggest a little wage of the general, but less than that. You suggest a little wager about what the revenue coming into the city would be in five years. I will give you right now a hundred to one or a thousand to one that the legislature and the governor of the state of Vermont will never support that proposal. I'll take you up on that. You got it. Of course, I may be governor, but that would be the problem. <laughs>
I politicized as I would like it to have been. I did come home from work, I looked in the paper, I saw that, that was listed in the paper, Rachel Lewis, um, so it was home or two, I didn't see a place listed. And I don't feel that, I mean, this may not be the place to get, to have a discussion on the plan, but there are, you are, you are extremely good with Rick Sharp in your, in your response to him. And I think that there are a lot of people who have a lot of concerns, and my questions were not, there were questions, and I don't see how a question can be inaccurate. I would recommend that the question to the board would like to have the board would like to start with this. I would like to understand for one thing how you can sit there and guarantee this as a student the school board to support this when you're saying that they may and if yeah, there is an excess of funding, they will get some response from what written guarantees do they have that they'll ever get any money out of that project? And exactly when will all that happen? Sure. The point of information is that right now this 25 acres produces $88,000 a year in taxes, which is probably the most taxes it's produced in the last 50 years. If this property is not developed, it will continue to produce $88,000 a year in taxes. In fact, in most deteriorating, declining areas, the tax base goes down. If this property is developed, there are no guarantees, but the projections are that it could be upwards of $70 million worth of construction that would take place and that uh, by the year 2005, $2 million worth of taxes could be generated. That is not a guarantee, that is a projection. What is a guarantee is there will not be one cent of money spent on this project unless there is a guarantee that there will be taxes generated which are sufficient to pay the principal and interest on the bond. You just have other questions as well. Questions on access, how do you guarantee access? Access is guaranteed, and I've heard this before. Well, if you take this, uh, the lakefront promenade and put it in front of condominiums that uh, uh, the, the people in the condominiums will say we don't like it. And uh, we would say to the people in the condominiums that this will be a legally binding perpetual document <coughs> that that is a public thoroughfare. And once these conveyances take place, this 50 foot promenade will in fact be, the, we will have the same rights to that as we do to a city street. And to suggest that someone, because they own a $150,000 condominium, would be able to go go out there and close the city streets is, is not the case. I, mean, I think the city attorney could, could speak to this. He's reviewed the, the legal documents, but there will be perpetual public access guaranteed on this 50 foot right of way. Your other question. I have a question of if you have this much lakefront space and you say that you're willing to give us 50 feet of public access, and yet you can go to California with a value of property that's exceedingly high, and yet you can go onto their beaches for a lot more than a lot larger access than 50 feet. Why is it that the citizens of Burlington are only being given 50 feet of their own land? That seems to me to be an inexcusable use of, of city property. Well, to, for a start, this is not our own land. This is land which is owned by the Central Vermont Railroad, which Alden has under has under option. They will purchase this land for upwards of four hundred thousand dollars an acre. So Alden will be conveyed to the city between the promenade and the lakefront park, uh, close to three acres of land, which carries a value in excess of, uh, of, a, of a million dollars. And, uh, and it's the position of the city and the position of the attorney general that this fifty foot dedication, which is uh, uh, the width of Church Street, is substantial open space on the waterfront. This is city land. I'm saying that my impression is that if we are not getting, we can negotiate for a lot more availability. We are, we're, first of all, you're talking about both and you're talking about affordability of citizens. What can we guarantee the citizens in terms of affordability? Before we get it, but you made a statement a few minutes ago. I don't know if you weren't aware of it. You, you said this was city land. If this was publicly owned land out there, a lot of what you're saying would be very, very valuable. This happens not to be owned by the not city of Do you understand that?
attorneys for the city of Burlington, as well as attorneys for the state of Vermont, that this land is not owned by the public, this, that this land is subject to certain public uses, and that the stipulations negotiated with the All In Waterfront Corporation satisfy those public uses if, in fact, it was ever determined that this land is subject to the public trust doctrine. Now, in view of that settlement, this thing could be litigated for the next 40 years. Some people would like to see that happen, but in, 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 uh, in the absence of a negotiated settlement of this issue, this thing would drag on and on and on, and uh, uh, Rick Sharp would have gray hairs, and it'd be in the courts arguing who owns his property. Um, I, I feel that $6 million to ask Thank you. 
because of all the facts, completely, don't say it's a people-oriented waterfront, it's a vague, meaningless buzzword. Now, people-oriented waterfront uh, could be anything. Of course it's going to be people-oriented. You're not building it for kangaroos. Obviously it's going to be people-oriented. But what do we really mean by that? What are the costs of the condominiums, for example? Why does this not tell the people of Burlington the cost of the condominiums are between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars? Why does this not tell the people of Burlington that there's a five, six, or seven-story hotel down there? Be honest with the people. Be upfront with them. And if you've got a good project, and if you trust the people, I think you can expect their trust in return. I think uh, another thing that's completely left out here is Ward Three. I'm very surprised about that. Uh, according to the CEO director, and I think according to anybody that, that knows what happens uh, when there's a major development in any particular area, there's going to be a spin-off effect and property values are going to rise tremendously. What is in place for people of Ward 3? They are in the, in the immediate area. The CEO director has said property values will rise in the immediate area. What is the plan? There's been a hint about some plan, but you've got to tell the people what the plan is. You can't give them a press conference a week before the election and say, we're going to take care of it all. You've got to let them know what it is. Um, other aspects of, uh, of what I got today bother me because there were, there were phrases in there that I don't think really gave an accurate picture. Uh, it says that it's low density. Well, what is low density? Relatively low density to another project that had been proposed there? But it's not low density as we understand low density in the city of Burlington. Low density is R6, maybe R15. What is the density of that? I think we have to know. I think we have to know about the Moran plan. That isn't mentioned in here. What is going on with the Moran plan? How much money will the schools lose when the Moran plan is closed as part of the pre-development agreement? That has to be told. I think we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars there, payment in lieu of taxes. I don't think that you can tell the people that it won't cost them a penny if it's going to really cost them $6 million in deferred taxes or more. Tell them that it's deferred taxes. Tell them it's millions of dollars in deferred taxes. Tell the people the truth. I don't think that you can give the people uh, a sort of a gloss over and expect their trust Give them a fact sheet. Tell them that $758,000 of this $6 million proposal is for underground wiring. Include that. That's very important. Finally, I guess on behalf of the public, as a parent, as a taxpayer, I'm demanding, I'm demanding that these questions be addressed, that these questions be faced honestly and openly, and that the public gets the information that they have every right to know. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Specific questions that you want to address to my committee 
the, I'm more than willing to look at it. All I heard is vague, vague questions you throw up at maybe you're not going to cost a penny or a tax revenue is not 1990. Many of these things have been thoroughly researched by my committee or as well as the CETO office, and I feel very confident in bringing this uh, to the voters. And I don't, and I, like I say, I take offense at the fact that you're, 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 you're suggesting that we may be doing this uh, underhanded. Uh, I think this proposal sells itself, and I don't think it is necessary to try to uh, deceive or, or keep this information from the public. But if you have a specific set of questions, you more than willing to answer them at any time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I have just raised several specific questions. I'll raise one more. We're talking about the Keystone the Park area as being the Naval Reserve Station. What does your committee have? What does Mr. Pavel have? What does Mr. Sanders have from the Naval Reserve saying that we're going to have that in 1986 or 87 or 96? What do you have? Do you have anything in writing for them? Mr. Pavel. Who suggested the Naval Reserve find a new location? John. What date and when does the United States Navy say that they will vacate that particular spot? Actually, what we have is not date specific, but I'd be glad to share, to share that Congress with you, which was adopted in the last session. I'd also be glad to sit down with you and spend a couple of hours in sharing factual information with you so that uh, some of these misconceptions that you have. Mr. Chairman, I take offense that every time a member of the public has a question to the CETO office or the administration, they are misinformed and they have misconceptions. I take great offense at that.
thing. Let's uh, uh, let's have a 10 minute recess, come back to the public hearing and make it uh, uh, statements from the public, and then we'll start with the meeting. Mr. Chair. Before we break, I'd like to introduce the two, the two drones people I have here. They'll be leaving at 9 o'clock, and, and I'd like the board to at least get to know who they are and then be introduced to the public. Uh, Jenny Savage and Sean Dampier from uh, sixth grade Lawrence Barn School, and they're part of the shadow program. And it's the second year that it's been in operation, and they have a chance to witness the public hearing tonight. Uh, <laughs> why don't you call me there? Welcome. Hey, I don't know, why not? <laughs> this guy is wearing wonder, it's just pockets.